<laughs> oh my gosh. All, all fun aside, guys, this is a really important moment. This is something you're never going to see. This is something, this is an absolute privilege to have Manny here with me yeah, in the south of France at La Fabrique, where he did his seminar, I'm in a seminar, and we're kind of like chip passing the night. Two guys that pretty much at this point in time are kind of running rock and roll. Or isn't that kind of like safe to say <coughs> that we're not sucking? Yeah. I call it it's the DS aspect. We don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we do some damn amazing shit. So, um, so yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm going to interview Manny here because this is Chris Lord Algae's week, and I'm going to ask a few questions of my friend here. Well, why don't I interview you? As well? Okay. I mean, this is your seminar. We're going to co share some questions right. here. All right. All right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll let you take the what? candles and the wine come, and then we'll dim yeah. the lights and get it all nice and sexy. Let's do that. That's yeah. right. So. All right, Manny. So, you know, welcome. Good to, you know, Thank we get to meet here. I know. We work in LA. We're like 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from each other. Right. We're like one sushi bar next to each other. Oh, man. You know. As and Abel. And uh, As and Abel, I go there too. I love that play. And you work with Kevin Mills at, Mills at, at Larrabee. Good old Kevin. And I've, you know, I go back to Larrabee in 87. I think the first song I mixed at Larrabee was Heart These Dreams for Nevison. 87. Which room? Well, it was at the G, it was an right, E room Studio room. B. Right. It was like Studio B, it was kind of yeah. small. Mm -hmm. Because this guy, Lul Silas Jr., mm -hmm. had the other room. Lul. And he had the back room. Right, and he played shit so loud that I had to complain. I said, look, I can't even hear my speakers because this guy next door is cranking it so loud, all I hear is his speakers. Is there a way that we can close a couple of doors here? Because he's in the lounge eating chicken, whatever, the doors are wide open, it's cranking. <laughs> And that was my first run in with Larrabee. It's like, really? It's this is like what it be. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and that's, you know, back in the mid 80s or late 80s. <clears throat> um, so it's exciting that you're there holding the candle. I'm there. I'm paying the there rent. 15, 14 years now. So it's, wow. Yeah, it's like, I love it. Dude. Well, that's fantastic. So who would you say is your biggest influence as a mixer? Who was the guy that you wanted wow. to copy when you jumped into the hot seat? Mm -hmm. Back in, you know, 19-something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a guy, Bob Power. He did all the uh, Tribe and he did uh, Erica. Or, you know, he did a, all that old stuff that just sounded so good. I remember hearing those kicks and snares and thinking, that's the guy I want to sound like. And, but, you know, mostly producers were a big influence because at the time... I was listening to everything. So for me, it was like, oh, I like how Bo Hill or, or, uh, would do this and Jane, Jimbo, Jimbo Barton do this. And so I became a big like producer fan. And then like Clear Mountain, you know, started discovering them all. But, but I gotta say, Bob Howard was like the first guy that I really listened to and went, oh shit. Because he was one of those guys that I just studied, you know, I just went home and went, how does he get those snares and those kicks and that bass? How does he do that? <coughs> uh, so yeah, no, you're right. But okay, so the question to you, what, who was that one guy that, that really <coughs> influenced you? You know, it's so funny you say that, that, you know, it seems to be the second letter in the alphabet's where it all began for us. So for me, it was Clear Mountain. To me, <laughs> to me, the reason that I went from being musician engineer, you know, band guy, producer, whatever, wannabe, as soon as I heard Good Times by Chic and pinpointed Clear Mountain, and then it became La Freak, and then it became Let's Dance, and then it became Reckless, and a slew of others in between, and, and Springsteen, but really, like, um, really, obviously, Brian Adams was like, holy crap, that's amazing. Right, right. But the Let's Dance kick and snare, like, put him on the planet as being, watch what I can do. <clears throat> and the SSL became the tool of trade. But after, you know, it really was, after Let's Dance, figuring out that he did good times, which was what, 78, 79, I put it together like, oh my God, that's some serious shit yeah. because of all the disco era. That was the best sounding stuff. Oh, yeah. It was like, did not sound like the other stuff. Right, right. 
that was the absolute inspiration. Like, if Bob can do it, I can do it. Absolutely. And you know what? Um, he raised the bar for everybody, right? Everybody. At the time, it was like, he just went, whoosh, okay, come and catch me if you can. But um, I remember the first time I like really was like, oh shit, crits, uh, ordinary love, uh, Sade. Wow, on that record, sure. That was that was a while back. Yeah, ninety four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's not even like a rock track. No, no. But see, at the time, you know, I grew up playing in bands and stuff, and then I. I was around a lot of hip hop, a lot of rock, and I really just, I was around a lot of hip hop at the time, and I loved that sound. And uh, I always gravitated towards that earlier in my career. And then sure. little by little, it kind of, you know, went back and just back and forth. But I've always, like I told these guys last week, I've, I'm and such a huge music fan. And I think, you know, I said, hey, I was telling these guys, I bet you if you have five of us in this room, we probably, yeah! Woo! Woo! Yeah. 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 All right, Mono and Mono, I'm drinking coffee because I'm talking, but you know, the wine <laughs> thing, I'll have to go down that road here in a second. Yes. Um, oh, look I, at feel us both, I feel better now. Both with the bobs. So it was, it was about, I, always, I said, hey, get five of us in this room, get Brower and, you know, get all, all, mm -hmm. all the peers, and we probably will, all say the same thing, which is like how we got into it because we fucking love music. The other night we had dinner, we, you know, we, you can tell we have a passion for, for music. And, and what I tried to pass on to these guys was like, look, you have to be passionate about it. You have to love it. We talked about it the other night. You got to love it. And we, we live it. We lived it. You know, every day, every, every single day. Or we live it every day still. Yeah. That's what you I'm know, saying. and yeah. I'm maybe a generation after you at this point, but I still have that same fire and excitement about it. Oh, it's in you. Yeah, of course. Of course. You're cool. probably, I, I say, you're probably hungrier now than ever, but you're a lot smarter in the way you approach it and the way you mix it that makes you a lethal weapon because the experience, smarter, what you've, you know, been there, done that, and your your gut your, your and we're kind of not heart. we're not screwing around anymore either yeah. we're kind of like looking at it as like you know what it's just too this is too much at stake to screw it up Absolutely. like back in the 80s when we were having a little too much fun during the sessions <laughs> um we were kind of screwing it up like all those all those situations that came and went by the wayside because we were scraggly getting high you know bucking around too much being cocky now we kind of we 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 grab the situation. We make the most out of it. Mm -hmm. We, I personally think that I have so much admiration for the musician, the artist, the producer, that I want to have the hardworking day and the hardworking night where we socialize and we really bond. Mm -hmm. And all these bands, all these years, they come back for album three or four or whatever. It's important that you have your social time with your, you know, your distant family. Yeah, we're back in the 80s, we were like, yeah, whatever, here's your CDC in one, yeah. three years, whatever. <laughs> And we never really responded or followed through with any of it because we were too busy worrying about the next fix, the next hit, the next band, the next whatever, and not actually caring about the road traveled. We were just worried about the next exit. Mm -hmm. Didn't look behind us. Like I look behind and go at my track record and these records. I'm like, God, if I would just want to hang out with him, 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 or them mm -hmm. for more than five minutes and not been such a dick all the time, uh, it would have been a whole hell of a lot yeah, fun. Yeah. So what do you think is the first song that took you from being just an engineer to being the cock of the walk? Like the hit that you got to brag about. You know, I'll tell you, the one song that I got maybe the most attention when people started calling, like, yo, what's up, man? What's going on here? Was, um, it was Whitney Houston back in the day, uh, uh, Heartbreak Hotel. And it was one of those where I felt I felt something like people were starting to take notice, you know. And people and producers wouldn't take note because they didn't never hear it. Right, because so, it wasn't mainstream. It wasn't mainstream. So at she all. we became the mainstream breakthrough artist. Pretty much, yeah. I think that was the one where the mainstream kind of took a little notice. Like, and then, yeah, those those type of artists started calling, like, hey, come to New York and mix five songs here. Go to Miami and make. 
five songs there. Do this here. And so it was it was the mainstream the mainstream. Like the, the, they thought, the, you know, guys that mix hip hop, they're like, oh, they they can't mix vocals. They can't mix this. They can't mix live instruments. And that was sort of the, the ones like, oh shit, if you made Whitney and Faith and and Kelly, oh yeah, then you should do Kelly's album or do this, you know, Faith. So start it started to spread. Definitely started to spread. You know, I was like 22 or 23 at the time. So that was like, you know, as you remember, it's like, yeah, all right, this is good, this is cool. So is this pre-Tools, 48 Digera, yeah, 224 track kind of thing? I remember we went to her house in Jersey and we took ADATs with us. And, and that was in Elwood Park, the studio, for, right? What's that? Elwood Park, where Whitney's studio was. Yep, yep. And we took ADATs and we transferred them to a 3348. <laughs> no, 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 this is before a 32 that. track, maybe. Yeah, we went to a 224. Yeah. Oh, 224 yeah. analog. Yeah, we, it was like a Studer 827s. I think she had two of those. And we just transferred everything. Transferring took like a day and a half. <laughs> the whole record. Just no, just that one song. Just to transfer wow. all the, the, the tracks. And it wasn't easy. It was like no, because the eight, you know, the remember, those eight ads were just insane. I don't know if you guys remember those or. <laughs> you know, but, um, what was the other one? You knew you were doing well if you had the uh, the task amp, the D eight eighty. Yeah, D eighty eight. Yeah, three of those. Oh, yeah, because yeah. they were a little more expensive. Right, you had an upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> You're a business class at least. <laughs> right. So yeah, no, it was cool. And you remember that you would take the D88s and transfer them through the desk, EQ the stuff on the way to the two inch, mm. and it all of a sudden got a whole lot better. Mm. Mm. I remember one album I did that with this girl Tina Arena. She was an Australian artist where it was all it was like six D88s, you know, uh, six uh, ADATs. Mm. So it was you know two twenty fours, and everything got like small fadered, a little bit of EQ to the two inch, and then mixed up the two inches. And it sounded considerably better. It's because everything got a little bit of a thing to it. And um, it was like the only D88 transfer and analog I ever did, and it was always really good, surprisingly, yeah. um, how that worked out in that, you know, 89, 1990, I think, yeah, 91 yeah. timeline. Yeah, that's exactly. When that was that weird, ugly moment because the 48 Digit was 500 bucks a day. Oh, yeah. And the analogs were all free, and everyone's doing home studios with D88s. The MCIs, and right? The, um, what was the, uh, the Sonys? Uh, no, no, no. What was the one right before the 3348? 3324s. Right before the 33. The Mitsubishi. The, Mitsubishi, the, Mitsubishi, the, yeah, the 32 XC, tracks. Uh, yeah. Uh, ah, yes, the 32. Well, yeah, the that Mitsubishi 880s, the 820s. Yes. The 800. The 800. Oh, man. The 800 was the regular one, the 880 was the upgrade. And Otari made it. You a guys DT. are lucky. I was telling you guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're lucky. Fuck. <laughs> so I, I was trying to explain to him why the 48 ditch became what happened because the elimination of the 224s, and I don't want to lock, and I got this, mm -hmm. and that's all it is. And the reason why I stuck with the format is because it eliminated the 224s, the number counts right, and it's open real, and it's oh. a finite number. Mm -hmm. mm. See, so yeah, it's interesting great. how our technology is tech. Sounds change. great. It doesn't sound bad. It's different, you know. It's a personal taste. Well, I love the sound of those. Being able to like edit on them, do those crossfades, and fly things around. That was back. Then. It was easy back then. Yeah. Yeah, and we you still could do it right now. Around. <laughs> it was a nightmare doing that with with you know, Drops. You know, the, the linkses. Remember, you had to do the offset, and you got to get that offset here. It's boom, sample, fly, done. A stereo pair of anything you could move around, Maybe. as long as it wasn't yeah. over like ten seconds. No problem. Oh. Beautiful. And you did it all the time. All the time, yeah. That's that's easily. Easy. Flying easy. chorus vocals around, all no the problem. Time. Yep, yep. And we were great at before Pro Tools. We had that. It was like our baby Pro Tools onboard sampler. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of all you need. We couldn't tune anything, but we could definitely move stuff that worked that was there already. Well, we had we had the uh, even ties to tune. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I was saying how uh, to get that reverse effect. The Took about 20 minutes sampling the reverb, getting it, automating it, or you hitting cut, recording it onto the two track, <coughs> flipping the tape, going back, grease penciling, counting to where you have. I mean, that process took at least 15, well, 20 minutes. Right? right, and that was when you were doing it at hyperspeed. Oh, yeah, oh, oh your, your guy had to be like, we were moving so fast. And it, it was like sometimes we hit. 
cut at the end of it. It's like, oh, maybe it doesn't really work. Right. Now and on the H3000, right? you can do it in one second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and on Pro Tools, it's not even oh. a problem. Yeah. So it's, uh, but listen, I, I'm so glad I went through that. I'm, I'm glad I went through the tape phase and, you know, learning how to, you know, I, I learned from Jimbo Barton. How to do guys, flanging? Like, what's that? How to do flanging? How, well, how to do all those things without, you know. The hand tricks. All, all that. And even some, some mic techniques that later on at least helped me sort of EQ things in a weird way. And I remember sitting there with like Queen Strike and you know uh, Empire. Uh, yeah. Were you with Jimbo and Empire? Uh, no, no, the uh, the Operation Minecraft. Yes. And that was like those are the like classics of Jimbo Barton. Those were amazing yeah, records. The guy's incredible. Sitting there like moving the mic two inches over, five inches back, and EQing with miking. I mean, that just seeing it, just watching him do that was, was incredible. And the choice of mics, and he moved so fast. He was like, "Come on, let's go." Well, doesn't. It? Three inches back, and we spent like a long time sounds, but that was just because they had the budgets and they had five different snare drums and you know and ten different kick drums, and we'd swap them and get the perfect combination. So how would you be there with Jimbo? You know, I was just assisting at the time. You were assisting Jimbo. Uh, yeah. Did you assist on Operation Micro? I assisted right at the end of Operation. Then we did uh, Last Action Hero, and then we did whatever the next album after that. So um, did you assist on Empire? At the end of it, very like when he was mixing. When so was you were there when he was mixing at, Empire. Well, he was taking it back to, at Enterprise. I was shadowing at the time. At and, Encore? Uh, Encore Enterprise. And Enterprise. And go to Enterprise. Close so Jet City Woman, you were there for that? Not Jet City Woman, which love that track. We were there for... Uh, for part of the, some of the songs. Some of the songs, because at the time he was recalling... Another Rainy Night or anything and, like that? Yeah, but you know, we he touched up all those songs like at one point. You know, he, he retweaked everyone. He retweet. I mean, it just was being like an con- Empire fan, which is one of the like, greatest rock records of all time, I think, wow. is Empire. And I probably listened to it a hundred times myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was always a template, the, the Jimbo thing. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, so it's like, you know, he's still to this day. He's a dear friend, just because he literally just watching him was. And I, you know, I was like nineteen at the time, and he was. I was the kid in the in the corner, you know. That but was I was so man. Cool. I was like taking notes. I'm like. Wait, how do you do that? You know, and so yeah, so that that was like my earliest like experience with, oh shit, that's what a mic can do in this environment, in this type of room. Oh, okay, boom. But yeah, he was a he was very instrumental, and in, you know, just in my early career. So Bob Power and Jimbo Bart. Yeah, pretty much. Much. That's great. So what would you say in the last five years, Claim the Fame song, Claim this Fame record, something you're proud of that maybe it's chart position or sales or something and people would say, oh yeah. You know, it's... Something that you're proud of, something just that... Just one? What, if I had to mention just, one just, song, just like one record? You know, one record, one album, one, one, something you're like, hey, this album did really right. well, I'm proud of this, you know, this is a band mm-hmm. that might have been a problem, but I, I scored it. Right. You know, I, 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 I gotta say that Continuum, John Mayer, you know, like mixing it with... Like with Brower, I mean Brower has become like one of my best friends, and and John would he was always like you you know you guys compliment each other and this and that, but when we I don't know I think I'm proud of that like gravity. Is this like, the new like born raised record, or What's just the, the the last array of John Mayer records? No, uh, listen, all of them I'm pretty proud of. But You've mostly, done all of them. Uh, the last three. The wow. Last, yeah, the last three. But Continuum to me was special because at the time. I think he was going from this heavier things, which is very lush and very pop, very colorful, uh, very uh, flat, not flat in a bad way, but, but Continuum was less is more. So we had a lot of room to EQ things. Everything has had its own space. So I think that that album for him was probably one of his most important ones because he was graduating from uh, have a hard Body on is a Wonderland. You know, oh. He was graduating from that. So it, it was sort of like giving him a sound that was really interesting if you ask Brower up he'll probably tell you exactly the same thing we're we're kind of searching for what is it not pop but you cool pop but yet he but Steve Jordan was producer so, so it's got an element of soul and it's got stacks and it's got Clapton it's got all these things but how do you make it into one and I, but I always say we put a little piece of our heart into every mix we've ever done 
So I, you know, we we take it seriously. And we so what did I say to the gang of fifteen that today? What's one of the emotion? What's one of the senses that's part of mixing emotion, being part of it, using your emotion? It's got to be your heart, your ears, and your eyes. If you see the mix, you hear the mix, and you and you feel the mix in your heart, become part of it. And you know, as I was putting them on the spot today, a part of their day of like. You got one pass, throw up the faders, make it sound like a mix like the bands in the room. Mm -hmm. Put your ball, and let's see, like, let me be the singer being impressed by you driving my bus. Mm -hmm. And see what, like, you're putting emotion to it. So, you're, it's like you say, it's their baby. And you know what, you have to put the same energy into mixing it as they into, into making it. Absolutely. And when they're in the room, and you're air guitaring, or air drumming, or moving faders, you're not a technician at that part, you're now the family member. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's become, and what we may have discounted, 20 years ago when we started and we were cocky and whatever. Um, so that's good. So flow right into John Mayer. See, the <laughs> diversity is very good. Yeah, yeah. And it's nothing, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's all about a hit's a hit's a great song, it's a great yeah. song, and the audience that buys it is what our job is. Yeah. You know? No, no, that's, you know, I'm having so much fun right now just because, like I was telling you the other night, man, I may go from like a grimy, grimy Nas record to... Uh, to a Blake Shelton record, to a, to a John, to a, you know, to a Linkin Park, or, you know, there's really, I've been so lucky that they haven't, no one said, oh, no, no, man, he can't do that genre, you know, I'm getting more calls for country records right now, and it's like, it's flattering, it's great, I'm having probably the most fun ever, and it's, and that, you know, and I always remember thinking, all right, I gotta diversify, I gotta diversify, I gotta, you know, this guy's give, you know, and we never, my manager always gets mad at me, but never did it just because of the, the, the check. It was always like, no, 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 listen, but this guy, Citizen Cope, wants his bread. But yeah, who, but who is he? No, 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 I heard his stuff. He's cool. Let me tell you, he's the shit. I mean, he's playing me stuff out of his little boom box that I'm like, who are you again? Where did you come from? And you got Santana on your record? And you got, what? You know, so those, those type of records, I'm like, look, dude, you know, because I, I'll do it for... A, hundred bucks a day I mean but I need to do his record and that was sort of the approach still t today you know listen if I if we like something it's, it's like fuck let me let me jump on it let me let me get my hands on it I you know but you know what in our job we don't have a choice as I was saying to them that probably part of the reason why our thing was working here at least I think is that if we're in front of the rig we use every day they'll never figure it out with us because we're going to be too fast mm -hmm. and too second nature to show exactly. them. Yep. So if we both stumble into the dark, mm -hmm. dark hell, if we yep. both walk into hell together, we can work on it and find the problems together. You know, I'm like completely unversed in a Neve, in an ADN or even the automation, and they're try I'm trying to show them how I mix on something completely alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so which makes you dig in and actually really be a mixer. You know, exactly. we're, so we're really, we're really listen, mixers yeah. on shit we don't know. Yeah. On the shit we know, we're rock stars, mm -hmm. you know. So they want to see... That's a really good point, though. They want to see the un unstar. Yeah. Wow. I mean, if you can do a mix on something you have no idea what it sounds like, how it works, that's a real mix. You know, mm -hmm. it may not be as good as what you're going to get on something you could perfect, but sometimes you got no choice. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to impress them by A, being my yeah. mix I printed off the nice. other rig. Nice. Now that's just really putting yourself in a bad position. So. Uh, but you know, it's they're not here for anything short of 100% honesty. Absolutely. And to get two guys who do what we do in the same room, and to sit here in and the just... the south of France. The south yeah, of France, that's yeah. That's um, that it well, shows you how important the right. moment really is, what you're doing. Um, you know, when we're crusty and old and you're still young and you're kicking our butts and taking our gigs, not for a while, um, <laughs> <clears throat> we're going to remember our lost week, of course, or years <laughs> that we spent here telling you everything we know and telling you everything we do. Um, you know what, we have, I don't know what he told you, because some of you guys are here, and I don't know what I'm going to end up telling you before I'm done, but, um, you know, we're not... We're not shy about sharing our knowledge because we are very secure in what we do and realize that we have this and this, right? We have our ears and our mind. So we can tell you and show you and do whatever, but every one of you has an individual style 
that no one can copy. And I want to make sure you all realize that. So no matter how many have used my plugins, my settings, his settings, his plugins, his EQs, his panning, his reef monitoring, compressor setting, it doesn't matter. What matters is here. And today, as I went through 10 demonstrations, well, it was 13 demonstrations, I think, um, I could see that no matter what EQ, console, rig, and setting, everyone had their own way of driving. And we're glad you guys are here to be a part of that. And we're glad to share. So salute to that. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah.